where is the pelvic floor? Is it, are we talking like in the vagina entry? Are we talking above the uterus? Like where? What are we yeah, talking about? Yeah, it's here? all of it. So the muscles are sort of a diamond between pubis, sits bones, tailbone. They include the muscles of the vagina, the perineum, the anus. I sometimes will talk about it like an elevator. You take the elevator down. You have to take it all the way to the basement. So we fully release the pelvic floor to open the elevator doors. Then maybe we put the laundry onto the elevator. (laughs) We close the elevator doors. Being a mom is the toughest job there is, and it doesn't come with instructions. So it's okay if you don't have all the answers. We'll figure it out together. This is Mom Brain with Ilaria Baldwin and Daphne Oz. Yes, that's just, I'm curious what happens at seven. A girl and a boy. Yeah, my nine-year-old's a boy, my seven-year-old's a girl. Amazing. Um, Yeah, it changes a lot because they're so independent. They make their own breakfast. They clean their own rooms. They Wheel their own suitcase. They do. Yeah, travel. They get more excited about travel for sure. Yeah, that gets easier. Everything gets easier, but then there's all of the social stuff, like, you know, the issues that my daughter has with her friends at school and the joining the teams and oh. no at seven and their it girls changes. there's a lot of uh, we we actually randomly had an uh, the the school hosted an intervention quote unquote when my daughter was three to tell us about the way that girls very early on and there's something animal in this um assert you know groups and the way that they create groups is by having one person who you know we all exclude and mm-hmm. by virtue of not mm-hmm. being that person you're part of the group mm-hmm. which is so dangerous and toxic and scary to that that they are doing that at such a young age um and how do you help her cope with that at seven now i think it has a lot to do with having time that i'm with her where i'm really present so that she'll talk to me because if i ask her questions what happened at school today why are you sad is it because someone was mean to you can we talk about who your friends are and she's like stop asking questions right. i don't want to share so i try and schedule a lot of time into the week where we're kind of doing something else we're coloring together we have you know lunch alone without my son where she'll just start to open up because then yeah. if she starts to talk about it i can talk to her about it our issue last year was that she was the best reader in the room but in her class but if she if the other girls knew it then they would exclude her so she was pretending she couldn't read as well as she could so then you have to you can't address it directly or they rebel so sort of you know celebrating accomplishments in myself and people around her and that kind of broke through it and now she's proud to be the best reader in the class have you guys watched the documentary america the beautiful Mm -mm. no really important documentary i think for any I think any parent, but I think especially moms of uh, moms of daughters, that it talks about sort of the psychology and how children, we, uh, children think that they are their parent. There isn't a separation of identity mm-hmm. for a long time. So the more that we put ourselves down, the more they think. Well, I am that too. So at, if I were to say, oh mm. my God, I'm having a, you know, a fat day, or one of these things that very commonly. Women, women say, "Are oh look at the bags under my eyes," or "Oh look at my gray hair," or whatever. Mm-hmm. Kids at a young age think that you're talking about them as well because there isn't that separation. It's mm-hmm. a really, really That's great documentary. Mm-hmm. It's weird also because even if you're aware of that, I think a lot of people don't realize the way you look at yourself in the mirror. You don't have to say anything, but if there's that scrutiny, you you know, sort of furrowed your brow, the whole thing. Um, it, it translates. They're so attuned. They are like little sponges. How, the reading thing. How did you get her to be the best reader in the room? Because we're just about to sort of start on the reading train. And I read to the kids a lot. But my daughter's four and she's mm-hmm. sort of four and, a, four and a half, she would tell you. Don't mess that up. But I'm, I'm curious. How did you get her to enjoy that and love it? And, and now obviously she's an incredible reader. Yeah, well, I had this moment where I was telling my kids they couldn't have screen time and saying they should read a book, but I was on my phone answering work Mm -hmm. emails, and I realized I needed to change my schedule so that I was getting my work done during hours that were for work and focusing on being present and doing things that I wanted them to model when I was with them. So now if I'm hanging out with them with nothing to do, I read a book in front of them. And I also... You know, we read our children storybooks, and then they start to read on their own, but I take advanced books that are, you know, sort of more preteen level that are really wonderful and I read them to them. So they start to get excited about chapter books and stories at a younger age. Oh, good for you. You have to lead Mm -hmm. by example because it is so true. They are aware of absolutely every single thing that we do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for I, I mean, you as well, all three of us have jobs that are 
kind of strange in terms of we can be working but at home, but we have to be connected to our device. Mm -hmm. And so then you think, wow, this is really great because I'm with my kids right now. I'm able to spend more physical time with them, but I'm not being present. And how do they understand that this is work? I, I had somebody explain that to me recently, how it what he does as a father, he says, you know what, I'm going to answer this work email right now. So right now I'm working and this is who I'm emailing and then I'm going to put it down and then I'm going to be back with you. But to really just, you have to say, this is what I'm doing and now I'm done. And that was work rather than just mindlessly looking on his phone or not even mindlessly, but for them, they could think that he's mindlessly looking at his phone and then they start to do the same thing and think more iPad, more iPad. And I also think if something comes up where the child needs you to be present, sometimes they'll ask an important question or have be doing homework while I'm working and need some help. I try and immediately put down whatever I'm doing and go to them um, because you can sort of look up and say, uh-huh, uh-huh, and not be paying attention, right. and they're aware of that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I'm going to dive into the diastasis for a second. The abdominal um, separation. So, you guys, we're sitting here with Erica Bloom. What you need to know is that she's the founder of Erica Bloom Pilates. We're... We can never get a reservation slash appointment because she is always jam-packed to the hilt because everybody wants to get in here and have her teach them how to build their core, look like ballerina bodies times 10. I mean, long, lean, tone, tight, all of that stomach and ass. Just going to say the best asses in New York, Erica Bloom Pilates. Um, but i am got to tell you, because we're sitting here in this room and it is making me feel like I need to put a broom handle behind my back because her posture is so perfect. And I'm like... Okay, suck it in, Daphne, sit up straight, <laughs> get it together. Um, so today we're going to dive into all things juggling, you know, motherhood and career and something I think a lot of moms out there think about getting your body back after a baby and what the effective way to do that and the safe way to do that is. And there are so many things we don't even know or think about when we're getting, okay, let's put it this way. When you get pregnant, everyone starts talking about all these great blissful moments with your newborn and and you start sort of immediately putting yourself into that mindset of becoming a mother. And there's so much education and interest around that new life, but so little focus on the physical element of how your body will change through the pregnancy, your body will change post birth, and then your body needs help to regroup after that process. So I I just want to, I mean, I have so many questions I want to pick your brain with, and I know Laria does too. But first off, can you just give people the lay of the land of like, what is this doing to your body when you have a baby? And what do people and, and moms not know about? Or what are we not thinking about in terms of the rehab after the fact? It's sort of a, a funny joke that you are your strength is taken away and your body changes and it you don't have access to it the way that you used to. And then you're handed a newborn and asked to do the hardest job that you've ever done in your life. And it is an amazing and wonderful time. And we should be focusing on that and on our child. But we there are a lot of changes that we need to not ignore but address. And just to make ourselves feel a little bit better and more able to be really good moms. Um, some of the changes in pregnancy that we don't think about is that as the baby's growing, the organs have to move out of the way to make space for the baby, and the psoas goes slack, and the pelvic floor gets stretched out during pregnancy, not just from if you have vaginal delivery. Wait, so psoas being <laughs> the muscle group that connects all down through your leg, your no, hip? No, that it, it starts from the spine, the lower spine, and then loops around to the front and connects to the inner. So if you have lower back pain, is it likely psoas related or? It's off. I find in yoga, it's often, but not not it, only. It, yes, it, it can be. Psoas dysfunction can lead to lower back pain. Um, if it doesn't recover post-birth, it makes regaining your posture and your strength difficult. Mm -hmm. So it's something that needs to be looked at. Um, so the psoas will go slack to make room for the baby and it, it can make your spine unstable and it can just make sort of the mechanics of gait and sitting and some normal functions difficult. And then as the organs move up and the baby grows, it moves up into the diaphragm, which is one of our muscles of breath. And so the diaphragm can't fully move down while we're pregnant and it can slightly atrophy. It becomes a little bit disconnected in the neuromuscular pattern and so then it can feel a little bit more difficult to breathe deeply and or get energy. After anybody a who's baby. been pregnant, one of the most alarming things for me with my first pregnancy is I was walking down the street and I couldn't breathe. Mm -hmm. And my belly wasn't even 
big at that big at that time. And there's a lot there. You have extra blood and everything that's pumping through your body. So many different changes. Mm -hmm. But it was alarming of like, oh, my God, I can't breathe. And then you get to like the end and you really, really can't breathe. Yes. And then some women have their baby and their diaphragm function and their psoas function and their core and pelvic floor come back naturally. But some don't. And they sort of say, well, what's wrong with me? And um, well, we have answers for that and they just need those resources. And I think one of the most important things, um, you know, throughout my own pregnancies, what stuff that I work with my students about is it's not just how you look from the outside. Because so many people, they say, oh, wow, look at this person. Had a baby a month ago. And people have done it to me. She had a baby a month ago and look at how, how she is now. I mean, my fourth time around, if I'm really, really honest, my insides still feel like a big old mess. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I feel... I feel weaker this time around. I had pneumonia when I delivered my baby. So talk about, you know, trauma on your diaphragm mm -hmm. um, and my ribs. Um, and, you know, everybody will kind of say, oh, well, you know, she's pretty much back to her, her pre-pregnancy weight. But that's not what's important. What's important is what's on the inside. And I found that if you focus on what is on the inside, the outside is going to take care of itself. Absolutely. Yeah, it's real. It's important. Yes, to not think of it as aesthetics, even though the aesthetics will be improved. It's a side, we care it's about a side the aesthetics. Over we here. care about yeah. the, aesthetics, the aesthetics, but a beautiful <laughs> thing is that that I always tell my students that's a side effect. Yes, your yeah. your aesthetic they will they will all just fall into place if you work on really being strong from the inside out. You are growing from the inside out, and it's all just going to fall into. Well, place. I think that's a lot to do with positive self talk, also. And I I think about this all the time that if we are ashamed of our bodies or angry at them or feeling uncomfortable in them. Your body's really smart. There is that psychosomatic response to, um, to to how you are treating it and how you're how you're telling it to respond to this behavior. And because that's, I think, a lot of my moms and, and I speak from personal experience. Like, I work out because it makes me feel good, but I also do want to see those results. And it can be very frustrating to have it take a very long time and I th uh, and and not be seeing those response uh, those responses and have your you know your sort of trajectory or progress plateau. Um, but I think as long as you're encouraging that positive self-talk, it actually, my body responds better. And I think that's a really interesting sort of, you don't expect the physical to respond to the mental as much as it does. Right. But I mean, I think at the same time, what you're, what you're noticing is just being your own personal cheerleader and being able to show up. Mm -hmm. Because showing up and doing a little by little every single day is the most important thing. If you go and you beat your body up once a week, you say, oh my God, I ate like this and I didn't move and I'm like, da, 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 now I finally have an hour. I'm going to go and I'm going to destroy myself. Your body sees that as an attack rather than a nurturing experience. Whereas if you can do these small movements, that that's why Pilates is so genius. Mm -hmm. If you can do these sm small movements that is from the inside, then little by little, your body gets stronger and stronger and stronger to the moment where it, you know, and then you get to a place where like, wow, I'm noticing a difference. Well, and the idea is that if, if we're re patterning it through these small movements with things like Pilates and yoga, then you're moving differently. You're moving better all day long. Right, and so day. those other 23 hours that you're not in a workout, right. you're actually building strength and changing your shape. So let's talk about that because efficient workouts, I think, are something we all would love to know more about. And I'm going to ask the dumb question just because I think it's important. Will you tell us a little bit about what is the pelvic floor? I think people talk about it a lot. And where is it? What is it? What are we accessing and what is Pilates and how does that and, and I mean, you know, yoga, like you mentioned, is a big part of this as well. But it how is it teaching you? I mean, little things like interlace your abs. There are these catchphrases mm -hmm. that mean so much to people who know what you're talking about. But to people who might not have tried it before, I tried my first Pilates class a week or two ago and I was uh, overwhelmed because as someone who'd sort of walked by classes on the reformer before my my, I'll be honest, my first response was like, oh, that looks so easy. And you get on mm. those machines, let me tell you, I was quaking. I was like shaking because lifting your own body weight and doing it in these very controlled ways is so incredibly reforming for the body. So, yeah, so give us hopefully, the, the hopefully land. you're finding muscles that you didn't know that you yes. had. Yeah, it looks easy, but it's not. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to tie it back into what you were saying before. I think a lot of times postpartum people they do they have this self-emotional hostility and they're beating themselves up and then they think they need to go and do a really hard workout and what happens with that it actually makes things worse if you're not connecting your deep core your transversus abdominis you're not being um paying attention to your pelvic floor and you're using a lot of superficial muscles and doing hard workouts you can actually make a lot of the issues that you have from pregnancy 
worse instead mm. of better. That can be really frustrating. On top of that, one of the most important things that's happening after we have a baby is our hormones are rebalancing. And that is an extremely important time for a woman for getting healthy um, after having a baby and moving forward into the stages of her life. And if we're doing really tough, aggressive, you know, HIIT workouts or cardio workouts that are stressing us more and depleting us, that can make the hormone recovery really difficult. So it's important to do things that feel good and that are gentle and that pay attention to the deep core. So the way that Pilates does that and does this for, you know, men and women and women at every stage is it is looking at the small muscles first, the intrinsic muscles that support the joints, and then the muscles of the deep core, the diaphragm, the transversus abdominis, the pelvic floor, and the multifidi. And looking at how those muscles support the skeleton into proper alignment so that we can move with proper joint function. So it's a little bit like, let's take the muscles that are supposed to support our posture and have them support our posture so that the muscles that are our mover muscles can be there and ready to access for movement. So our body is now more efficient, but we're also engaging more muscles than we would be if we were just kind of getting into our dominant patterns and using you know, quads and superficial abs and superficial back muscles to support ourselves. From my experience of of working with people, they get very confused by all of the different muscle groups and mm -hmm. it feels very overwhelming. And then they just throw their hands up and say, OK, fine, I'm just going to do some crunches and call it a day. Yes. And they should not be not, doing yes, crunches after not, having no. a baby. Guys, no, no, don't no. do crunches after having a baby. But <laughs> what I find, and please correct me if I'm wrong, because I feel like you have so much more experience about this than I do, um, is the idea of just activating the navel towards the spine and thinking about zipping the core up, almost thinking of like the middle of the rectus abdominis, so at the middle of the six pack, and thinking about knitting everything together as you walk. So basically, in yoga speak, connecting your bandhas. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. So uh, that's a really nice way to think about it. One of the things that I think that was really important is so let's talk about the pelvic floor for a moment, right? The pelvic floor is the dome at the bottom of the pelvic outlet that holds our organs in. And um, when we're pregnant, we're putting a lot of weight down onto the pelvic floor. And so the pelvic floor gets overstretched. And then if you have a vaginal delivery, the pelvic floor rapidly expands and then contracts. And in either scenario, the pelvic floor will sort of lock. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the resistance at length doesn't weaken it um, per se. It can. But the main issue is that the pelvic floor has now become very static. It has locked and we need to restore its suppleness. So when we're thinking just about pelvic floor strengthening, we want to think about that bunda, that feeling of lifting something up and sucking the belly button in. But actually, we need to first allow it to move. And so we want to think of the pelvic floor opening, which sounds really counterproductive if we're we've had a baby, but it needs to first be able to release to be able to engage. So we do pelvic floor stretching and we do breath work into the pelvic floor to find some movement and some connection. And then we start to work on strengthening. Which is really genius, exactly what you're saying, because you must have the yin and the yang. Yes. You must have the balance. You have to be soft in order to be strong. Correct. And that's why I think Pilates, yoga, um, so many different, at, at this point, there's so many versions of it work so well because you think about activating a muscle and then releasing a muscle. If you go to mm -hmm. the gym and you'll see people who live in the gym and they have just built up their muscle and they've gotten so tight, they cannot raise their arms above their head right. because they are so tight. They're so tight. Not like, mm -hmm. let alone that their muscles are actually hitting their head and when they raise And that's not a strong muscle if it's, it's, if not, it's so Which short. I think is such a nice metaphor for the feminine is that you're mm -hmm. going to be able to be flexible, limber, yes. Yes. multitasking yeah. yes. and, get, and get that strength at the same time. Mm -hmm. I have to ask the anatomical question because I just I, I live in this space and I feel like I still don't know where it is. Where is the pelvic floor? Is it, are we talking like in the vagina entry? Are we talking above the uterus? Like where? What are we yeah, talking about all, here? It's all of it. So the muscles are sort of a diamond between pubis, sits bones, tailbone. They include the muscles of the vagina, the perineum, the anus. 
And so we think about when when we read like a like Cosmo, yeah, and they yeah. say, "Where am I putting the donut?" <laughs> like, yeah, like that's they're what. like strengthen. They're like strengthen your pelvic floor, do a Kegel, right? Which is a little bit like just closing the urethra to stop yourself from peeing. You have to actually think of it as something bigger. It's more like the rings of a barrel inside of the pelvis. So you're taking all of the muscles and gathering them together, and then lifting all the way up to the top. So maybe a feeling like closing the vagina all the way up to the top of it instead of just spasming the muscles. Mm -hmm. oh, I, I will say to my students, think about like you, you have to pee, but you can't pee for like a really long time and you have to really squeeze. And that idea of not, I'm done, not just, if we're getting like really graphic, no. not just at the bottom, but this all, is the, all the way up. Yeah. And then at the very top of it, then bring the belly button in towards the spine so that you're finishing the action up. And then they need to think about the release as well. So if we, we I sometimes we'll talk about it like an elevator. You take the elevator down. You have to take it all the way to the basement. So we fully mm -hmm. release the pelvic floor. We have to open the elevator doors. Then maybe we put the laundry onto the elevator. <laughs> we close the elevator doors. And then we're going up first floor, second floor, third floor, all the way to the penthouse. But then you have to slowly. At least we're in the penthouse. Yeah. We, gotta, we, we, got, we live in the penthouse. And then we slowly release down and you have to hit all the floors mm. on the way down. And sometimes the release is great. almost the hardest, but it's really important. And this is women at every age, which at I think is age. so critical. I mean, this is great. For for sex, this is great for incontinence. This is great for just, I mean, I know people who like pee when they laugh. I mean, that's mm -hmm, a whole, mm -hmm. this is just, and I, I want to just go back to the mental of it too and the, and the emotional. I think that there is so much to be said from having a strong core and, and, and that giving you a real sense of yourself and that giving you a real sense of agency in your life and yes. that feeling like you, um, that, that you just have a strong center. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious, what are some of the worst mistakes you see being made by moms who are trying to get back in shape? And they're, you know, I see this in diet all the time where you think you're making all these great choices. And then in reality, you're eating things that are holding you back. You're eating things that are fueling addiction. You're eating things that are making you tired and hungry. So you have to eat the wrong things to, you know, rebalance from the things you thought where you were doing well. What do you see in exercise and physicality that moms should are doing and that's probably not great for them and what should we be doing yeah i i see a lot of moms are really just not taking time for themselves after they've had the baby and i think just doing that just getting out and doing something that you love is really important and then i see them choosing workouts that are way too hard postpartum and that they hate and hurting themselves or make oh, we're going to talk about diastasis but opening their diastasis further and getting frustrated and thinking that they have to be working in a way that's painful and hard to improve. And it just isn't true. We should be taking small steps forward and working on those small muscles and doing things well and doing so it's like a quality over quantity, but also t doing something every day. It doesn't have to be like that perfect hour and a half workout. If you do 15 minutes of pelvic floor and TVA work, you're doing a lot for yourself already. That's what I talk about. With, on, on my Instagram, I post these little very short videos called found moment workouts when mm -hmm. as a mom of four I really need to find my moments I'm not going to necessarily have an hour to be able to go to the gym but if I can stay active at different points of the day even if it's five minutes here and two mm -hmm. minutes here and 10 minutes here or maybe 30 minutes yeah. there it all adds up it really does and and there's a lot of studies that show that doing little things throughout the day better. is better than doing yeah. one big thing in the morning than sitting yeah. around all day. And I also encourage moms to do things with their kids. You know, I, when I had newborns, I did workouts with them and mm -hmm. I took walks with them. And now we do something active. We do a sport That's every amazing. day and, you know, just stay moving with the kids. Good what are some of your traditions with the kids? I feel, I love getting in. I think there's so much magic in the mundane and the way that you you mentioned before, the reading that you do with them. Um, I think that there are little ways that we structure our day that maybe to us seem like, oh, we could make things more interesting. We could do more fun things. But those little sort of predictable moments are actually what make places feel like home, places feel yeah, safe. I so agree. what are the traditions that you love with your kids um, who are seven and nine? Right yes. Now? Yeah. Uh, we always snuggle in the morning. They come climb in bed with me. They oh. get up really, really early and I like to stay in bed a little longer. So they come climb in bed with me at like five, five thirty and we snuggle, which is really important. It's important to have that oxytocin and get all those hormones going, those love hormones going. Um, I, I have them um, assist me with cooking. So I cook 
pretty basically every meal. And I think it's important for them to come and kind of choose ingredients and see what goes into things so that they're thinking about what they're eating and getting connected to it. Um, one of my favorite traditions is anytime they have a random day off school, we jump in the car and drive up to Hudson River Valley and go hiking. So oh, nice. We have one of those coming up with election day. I have to vote first, but then, yes, then we'll go first. hiking. <laughs> Getting back to what you said about moms not taking enough time for themselves, I mean, that's something that we hear a lot, but I find is a really, really hard concept to grasp because you're needed all the time. Yes. And, you know, I'll I'll get, um, you know, the comments on on social media about of like, oh, you're so focused on yourself because you're going out for a jog or, oh, you're going off to take a class or something. And that is really... It, it, it's so unhelpful, not just because it's not nice and you should only say nice things, but but also just because you have to be the mom has to be strong in order to be there for the for your kids. You yeah. have to lift them up. You have to have the energy to wake up at two o'clock in the morning if your kid has a fever. You have to lead by example. You have to lead by example. And it's okay. Yes. You and women have to start giving themselves permission to be selfish in the best way, which is, hey, you know what? As as people say, I gotta put my oxygen mask on first. Yeah, I and I think I think it really is if I'm going to go and do a Pilates class, I will say to my kids, I'm going to do this because it makes me feel great and wonderful. And I think it's, it is so important to lead by example. And I think going out and doing something for ourselves is doing just that. And of course, you know, the cliche that it makes us better moms when we're home is really, really, really true. You're less likely to yell at your child to put their shoes yeah. on if you've exercised that yeah, day. Absolutely. I think happy kids do have happy parents to show them how it's done. I also, what frustrates me to hear uh, uh, what, well, let's speak English. <laughs> what, what frustrates me about hearing something like that is part of what I think is valuable about social media is that you are able to share some of these real, you know, life tips and hacks and things. People want to know, hello, you've had four kids. You look amazing. How do you do it? And then you show them, you know, little by little how you're helping yourself do, feel strong, feel good in your skin. And then, and then they're, they're like, mad at wait, you. They're, they're like, then they're like, ah. but, but not that. <laughs> but, but you're <laughs> that, so selfish and that one horrible. That not okay. It's so crazy no, to most me. Of, most of it's positive. Most of it but there are, positive. there are. But you know what? We do focus on the negative, and that's a that's a it's a bad habit, and mostly ones that you know I've realized that that has to be a a, a conversation I have to have with myself to be like, you know what? These negative people are going to be out there. They're not just doing it to me. But when it comes to something like taking care of yourself, which is something that's so important to me, um, that is why I became a yoga instru instructor mm -hmm. because I want to teach people to take care of themselves. Period. End of story. It mm -hmm. is as simple as that. Well, and one reason I like Pilates and also yoga for exercise is that it's it's a method where you have to be really, really present. So yeah. it teaches you how to be present. And for me, that has been what has made me a good mom is that maybe I do take the time to go out and exercise and I'm away from my child when I do that. But then when I come back, I am right there with them. And I think those moms that are bashing you on social media, if they were super present with their kids all the time, they would realize they have that time they'd to be, go for a run. They'd be spending their time doing other things. Yeah. Well, um, if they were super present, super present with themselves, just, exactly. probably they would and, and, then, it, and then forget about, you know, you know, kids for our for the non moms out there. What's the point in living life if you're not doing it presently? Mm -hmm. You're really mm -hmm. wasting your right. time. Right. You know, I mean it gets back to, you know, philosophy one oh one. What is the good life? The good life is to be here and now and aware and that's when you can make True choices, true change in your life. Absolutely. Going back, to, you brought up, we're, we're debating we have, how to say it, diastasis recti, diastasis recti. Mm -hmm. I feel like all of a sudden, part of it's, I had kids before a lot of my friends did. Now, finally, all my friends are having their babies, and I'm so excited. Um, except for Hilaria, who had more, I <laughs> better, more, more I faster. I better be your friend, Daphne. <laughs> Obviously, but when I had Philomena, I hadn't gotten to meet you yet, which was That's so true. sad. No, we are, we are, we are we, quick, we are fast yes, friends over the past few years. New and fast yes. friends. Um but I remember feeling uh, I remember feeling like back then I just had no idea what I was doing and I sort of just thought I would live it and figure it out. But now that a lot of um, a lot of these women that I know are having their babies, diastasis recti has come out full steam. And I feel like everyone is talking about it and everyone thinks they have it or do well, have let's, it. Let's start with a definition of it, because so mm -hmm. many people yes. it's it's a very 
a like big word, two words. It's two, <laughs> it's two big words, <laughs> which is too much for mom brain. Two big words that we don't even know how it is should be properly pronounced. So let's find out what it is. Yeah. So it's the diastasis recti is the separation of the two sides of the rectus abdominis. So our rectus abdominis is our six pack muscle. It goes from the bottom of the sternum to the pubis. It gives us that. Shape. Which all people have. It's just sometimes under lots under, of other layers. Under other things. <laughs> <laughs> but that's under a thing. great be... eggplant parm and right. a few slices of cake. <laughs> exactly. Correct. Yeah. Ch- we all have this muscle. Cake. We just can't always see it. Yes. Um, and it's the muscle that does crunches. It's the muscle that does flexion. And it has a connective tissue band down the middle called the linea alba. Our body is filled with connective tissue. Every muscle has connective tissue. Every organ, um, all of our cells are surrounded with it. And the linea alba is running north to south, south to north. Correct. So it is a band of connective tissue. It's going from the bottom of your sternum all the way down to your pubic bone. So the two sides of the rectus can separate and the linea alba doesn't tear. It just it becomes stretched. It loses its integrity and it can open wide enough that actually your intestines can start to poke through. And what it will end up feeling like if you have one, you might end up feeling like you can't breathe as well because the muscles involved, uh, the, the core muscles are muscles of respiration. They assist with breath work. You might feel like you can't go to the bathroom because the pressure from the connective tissue aids with digestion. You might feel like you have to pee all the time or even um, poop your pants. Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) because the muscles of the deep core are part of muscles of elimination. The pelvic floor is involved. Some women feel like they just don't have as much energy. They can't take a deep breath because the diaphragm works in conjunction with the linea alba and the muscles of the core. Um, and then what we hear a lot is I just my stomach just doesn't look the same. It's all lumpy and weird and it sticks out all the time and I still look pregnant. Um And when I engage it, I end up with this funny dome. So even Mm -hmm. during pregnancy, you'll hear women say, I have this pyramid sticking out of my belly. That's a a diastasis. And if you are at home and you have these things, you should go and find a diastasis uh, physical therapist or a Pilates instructor that's trained in healing diastasis recti. So you shouldn't check for it on your own? You shouldn't check for it on your own because the, the way to check for it um, to, where you do a crunch and you kind of poke around and feel if there's a separation, that can actually make it worse. So you want to have a professional do it for you. So can you check us? So can. yeah, can I get personal? Like right now? Yeah. <laughs> can I get personal? Let's okay. Get personal. So um, my, I never, I haven't, I didn't have that after one, two, or three since number four, which was more complicated. I mean, you know. Vaginal birth, everything was fine in terms of that. But I had a bigger belly. My baby was Mm 8'2 and was producing extra fluid. So my belly was really, really big. And I'm a small person. Um, And, you know, my obviously, you know, my belly has gone back and it looks fine, but I don't feel as strong. Mm -hmm. And I have noted there was a moment during pregnancy where I felt um, this stretching right in the middle that was alarming. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know exactly what that was. Is it just a pregnancy we'll, we'll, sensation? We'll check you and see. But I do hear that a lot that when you, I had also, I had extra amniotic fluid with my first pregnancy and, and had it's a tough, diastasis. Right? And it's, it, I, that's a very common cause. There are lots of causes. Um, but you're also five, five months out. Yeah. So, so you should still. not be feeling like yourself again. It takes time. Yeah. Yeah. It, we need to let it take time. It took nine months to grow the baby. It might take two years to feel okay again. Just keep taking right, care of yourself. Right, but I want to make sure and, that I'm not absolutely. doing anything that could potentially be making it worse. Yes. And for me, I am the kind of person where I want to squat in a bush, pop the baby out, and then continue on my way. I'm your mm-hmm. worst nightmare. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So, I mean, no, I that's just how women have to, done it forever. I, and, I love and that. And I'm just happier that way. And, you know, but this time I have to say that my body is telling me something different. And I believe in listening to your body. And I just don't have for myself, forget about practice what you, you know, talk about practice what you preach. I mean, I am definitely sometimes the cobbler that has holes in my shoes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but um, I want to make sure that I am not, I am a fit run around, do lots of different things, but I want to make sure that I'm not doing something that is not smart. 
Great, yeah, let's check it. Okay, okay. so really, really, before you start, so really fast, guys, the first the first mistake we were all making, we were roll, sitting on our butts and then rolling back and lying on the floor. You don't want to do that because if you have diastasis recti, recti, that's like aggravating it even more. So we lay on the side like mermaid pose and then you know lie down flat once you're already on the yes. ground, like so. Mm-hmm. And we're marveling at Alari's amazing belly button ring, which is so pretty. Right, which is hiding my mom belly button. That's okay. the whole point. So this is where the linea all that is in here. You want to go next to her? No, I want you to okay. Go what you're okay, so Alari's lying down, and um, Erica has her stomach. Basically, if you go from the belly button four inches on either side vertically, she has her fingers, and she's just pressing in between where the um, six pack is gently, connecting. Gently, 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 very gently. And then, very gently. And then lift your head up. Yeah. Okay, so Hilari's lifting her head a little bit off the floor, trying to engage the abs. Finger and a half. A little bit, little bit, but it goes and all the way down. And that's the here. problem. You feel all the way down the leg. Erica feels like there's a little tiny I'm gap. Okay, yeah, and we're going slightly under the underwear line because look, it connects all the way down to your to this, your vagina. You this know, portion of it is not as important as this. Right. The upper abs aren't quite as important as yeah, the lower I mean, abs because the lower abs are more structural. And that's what really needs to be closed up. So we're, she has a small diastasis. It's going, it's about a finger, a finger and a half wide, but it is going all the way from the pubis up to the sternum. And so we want her to not engage her rectus as it's healing. And so 80% of women actually get some diastasis during pregnancy, and some of them do heal on their own. Hers might be one where it would heal on her own if she um, does behaves, if she doesn't do any of the contraindications. So contraindicated would be engaging the rectus abdominis or over-engaging obliques. So no ab work that isn't just for the deep core, the transversus abdominis and the pelvic floor. So yeah, you're right. Things like just living life are going to use the core. So what we want to do is train her to access her deep core to do things like walking and picking up her child and putting the car seat in the car and carrying the groceries. So a lot of it is about patterning, getting reactivated in pelvic floor, transversus abdominis, diaphragm, multifidi, so those other muscles can take a break while the connective tissue heals. How, How can you tell if you're engaging the deep core or the more sort of superficial decorative muscles? You know, this is why I love private sessions and private Pilates is that you really need the feedback of an instructor, the touch feedback, the verbal cueing, the props to make sure that you're doing it well. Um, But one thing to think about is that the muscles, the transversus abdominis wraps all the way around. So it's like a corset. It's not just at the front. And when it engages, it pulls the back and the front together and pulls the side waist together front and back. So it's like one of those 80s waistbands where we had like the ruching on the side and the flat band across the front and back and then we it was like pleated pants and lots of pockets and <laughs> let's go back <laughs> <laughs> and so it isn't a feeling just of gathering the front of the belly or pulling your belly button in or hardening your belly it's more of a feeling like if you're a tube of toothpaste and you're going to squeeze the toothpaste front and back and the toothpaste is going to go down and up so you're narrowing the the back skin of the belly to the front of the sacrum and the spine. And they're sort of feeling like a magnet together. Mm -hmm. And then they lift up and they lengthen the spine. And those little details are really important because the superficial abs actually shorten our waist. So now now Daphne is getting examined and um, and this is like the, the like the nervous moment. She looks very nervous. You should very nervous. This is kind of like we're we're um I feel like I'm a sports commentator. So she's going to lift her head up. And letting her crunch just for the test, but the crunch is not good for the diastasis. So we don't do that. We won't do that again. Actually, it, it actually is good. There's a tiny little one finger right there. You have good integrity in the connective tissue. Can I feel down lower? I, I unzipped my pants, Daphne. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so basically, so, so basically she's... No so diastasis. What? Well, yeah. oh, that's amazing. She, she has none? No. 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 This, this little, like, less than one finger here, we don't consider diastasis. So it's, mine's people, one and a half? You have one and a half, but m- what the reason we consider it diastasis is I can feel the lack of integrity in the connective tissue all the way down into the pubis. All the way, all the way down. down. See, mine is a very, mine is a very low, a low... Yeah, because right my because there's something is going like on. Agony yeah, time. something is very off. Your psoas is wacky. Sit. Wow. Take a breath, and then 
bring one knee in. So what she's back. doing right now is she's checking Daphne's back and having her lift one knee in and then the other to check her psoas. And so totally dysfunctional. Okay. Would that explain why my lower back is in constant pain all the time? Like I feel like I need to crack my back all the time. It's, it's a reason. When we have pain, it really has to do with how the whole system is out of balance. So you have this instability from your right psoas, but there's probably another spot that's overly tight that's playing into the pain as well. Yeah. So diastasis can cause back pain um, in women postpartum. Because when we're pregnant, we have a lot of hypermobility and the pelvis opens up, the sacroiliac joints become unstable, the sacrum sometimes goes out of alignment. A lot of times during labor, the pelvis is put out of alignment as well. And then we don't have the right access to the core muscles to re-stabilize. And so you can continue to have back pain throughout your life if you don't correct the diastasis. How can we heal from this. Yeah. So when you're looking at healing diastasis, one of the most important things is just to stop doing the things that are keeping it open. So avoiding flexion, which is crunches and roll-ups, and really not doing ab work that's unsupervised by somebody that specializes in diastasis recti. Because we can, for example, be doing plank and say, oh, well, that's not a crunch. But if we're gripping the superficial abs and popping open the linea alba, then that's not a good choice. We want to start really gently and with supervision. The other thing to think about when healing it is, is what other issues in your body are playing into it and maybe why do you have it. Some women simply get it from the size of their baby and how much fluid they had and how small they are and then the stretching that pulls it open. But for some women, it was because they had a dysfunction in their core to begin with or they had a postural imbalance. People with scoliosis or who are side bent, they're going to have a dominant oblique. One side of the abs is going to be stronger than the other and that hooks into the linea alba and pulls it open. Or a little bit like what we were looking at with Daphne, if there's a shortness in the low thoracic spine that pu pushes the ribs forward and puts you into lordosis in the thoracic, that can start to cause um, strain that can open the linea alba, et cetera, et cetera. So the postural imbalances need to be corrected along with it. But when we're looking at just specifically correcting the diastasis, what we want to think about is how the muscles of the deep core are assisting our breath. So when we inhale, the diaphragm engages down and the pelvic floor relaxes. Those are two things that, that can be really challenging postpartum. When we are doing those actions, the transversus abdominis, the deep core, and the connective tissue of the abs, including the linea alba, are resisting the weight, the pressure of the organs as we inhale. That resisting is part of their strengthening. So if we're not releasing our pelvic floor and engaging our diaphragm, we're not challenging the deep core in the way that we should be. And then when we exhale, the pelvic floor engages up and the TVA, the deep abdominals, wraps. And as it wraps and engages on the exhalation, the linea alba closes and then the diaphragm relaxes up. So that's a little bit of like a pressure system that involves organ movement. It involves some of the muscles of the back and then it involves the deep core, the pelvic floor, the diaphragm. And if we're not working those muscles together in that way all day long with every inhale and exhale, it's more difficult to heal the linea alba. Which sounds really overwhelming, it but... It's just breathing. But but it's kind of like touch typing. You know, when you when you learn to type, it's, you know, you're sitting up. At least I did like super old fashioned where like you have, you have your hands covered and it's like F space, T space, Z space. And mm -hmm. it feels like, oh, God, I don't know where all the different letters are. And then you're able to write, you know, the cat walked across the street. And then eventually you are able to write your thoughts and then you can write paragraphs exactly. and go That's on and a on. Great it analogy. really starts to snowball and it all comes together. Yeah. Now, for our listeners who are not around a really amazing Pilates instructor, mm -hmm. what do they do? Yeah, so I think practicing breathing, which sounds silly, but we actually, we, we it's like she's saying with the typing, we're going to practice breathing properly. And they say to do 100 to 200 in the morning when you wake up and then again in the evening. And then thinking about your breath consciously, that will really pattern so that it's like you're now doing 
10,000 reps a day of deep core work because we breathe all the time and we breathe right. in our You'll sleep. Do you, doing it do even you when you're have focused. do you have any online resources that um, that our listeners could look at? Because everyone should get to heal, not very, just those of us right. who live in New York and LA. Very confused about how to breathe properly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Especially since this person has been breathing since the moment that can we, she can took we, her first gasp. Can they breathe with us right now? Can they, they, yeah, let's, let's do let's, it. Okay. Let's do it. So we're going to inhale slowly through our nose. Allow your belly and back to expand. Allow your pelvic floor to soften. And then exhale and lift the pelvic floor up and draw the belly button back and lengthen the spine and soften the ribs. Yeah. And they should do that 100 times a day? 100 times a day. And what you okay. want to do is do it in the mirror. Take your shirt off, take your clothes off, look in the mirror and check, are you rounding your spine when you pull your belly button in? You shouldn't be. We should be feeling like we're connecting our spine and our belly towards each other, staying neutral. Which means keeping the glutes, a.k.a. the butt, soft while you're doing it. I've noticed that people will tend to tense their butt, and that's why they they jet the pelvis Oh, you don't forward. use your butt to clench, though? I thought if you're bringing your pelvic... No, no you don't so wanna... glute muscles are not part yeah. of the pelvic floor. You want to feel more... It's more like you're nodding your clitoris back towards the back of your vagina. Okay. I'm working on this as we speak right now, which is my face it's is actually, all like screwed up and It's actually concentration. impossible if you talk about it. It's in, like essentially impossible to yeah. not be doing it at the same time. I um, have to ask about uh, the other part of the mom's stomach that everyone is concerned with, which is the fatty upper pubic area, aka the fupa. So as in, oh, as in like the apron, I think a lot of people talk about it. And um, you know, eating obviously has a lot to do with it. And we didn't even get to chat about like what your sort of go-to meals are. You said you love to cook, but mm -hmm. um, you know, as someone in in great physical shape and also with young children, I'm really curious what you eat and what your family eats and what you like to cook. But um, but also talk to us about this fupa and how we can address it since it's probably not just breathing for this one. <laughs> well, a lot of women that have that they do have a diastasis, and it is coming from that because what happens with the diastasis and not having that pressure against the organs from the integrity of the connective tissue is the organs sit lower. So you're, you might have everything kind of fallen down and dumping forward instead of sitting back and up against the back of the, of the torso cavity. For you with your tightness in your upper psoas and your, the low, the, it's like the thoracolumbar junction is dysfunctional on you, it pushes your organs down and forward. So some of it is that. Interesting. The, if there's a layer of fat there, if a woman has had a C-section, many times it's that the scar has adhered, and then they should be doing massage on the scar. Mm -hmm. And you can start doing that at any point once you're cleared from your doctor. And if you haven't started right then at six weeks and you you've had your baby two years ago, do it now. And just go in and get some coconut oil and move it around so that you it's can... It's never too late. It's That's never so too late, important. And it's never too late for diastasis. I have women that are 50 and they had their kids when they were 19 and we're healing it now. Because if you leave it, you can get, you can have prolapse. You can yeah. have bladder prolapse or mm -hmm. uterine prolapse. It plays into that. So you want to address it. Now, I see um, a lot of women as they are pregnant, that they are determined to still do crunches while they are pregnant. And it's one thing that I was told when I got pregnant with Carmen, don't just don't do your belly is going to get bigger. Yeah. So what do you do? And I hear a lot too, where people say, well, I'm about to get pregnant. So let me do as many crunches as I can <laughs> now. now. Or since I can still do them in my first trimester, let me yeah. do them. Actually, really, the moment that you start thinking about wanting to have a baby, stop doing crunches. Our six pack muscles, not what makes our stomachs look good or flat anyway. Like I, I've never done a crunch. You guys want to see? Yes, yes let's see. Yes. Oh my, oh, God. never done a crunch? That's a nice ass. We, never done a crunch? I mean, that's <laughs> amazing. That's actually, that should be your tagline. Never done a crunch and then just a <laughs> no picture of your perfect here. core. <laughs> that's amazing. But I love that because I hate crunches and I feel like if you don't have the form right, you actually do so much more damage so much than more good. Damage. You get that dome right. stomach, you hurt your neck, Correct. you hurt your back. And we're all so rounded all the time anyway with our computers and our phones and looking down at our children. I mean, these new as a new mom, you're looking down at your child into their eyes as you're feeding them and you should be. So we want to do the opposite movements mm -hmm. when we're exercising. So yeah, no crunches while you're pregnant. And then no, just don't do anything that doesn't feel right. If a trainer says this is what you should be doing and it doesn't feel right, don't do it. Trust we really have great, amazing, amazing connections to our body when we're pregnant. Okay, we have to let you go, but really quickly, just give us one day's meal plan. It's very different every day. My breakfast 
I like to vary it so that I get a lot of different nutrients and so I don't end up with food sensitivities. Um, this morning I had an egg with avocado. A lot of times I'll mm. have coconut yogurt with collagen. Um, for lunch, I like to have salmon. And then I try and have three or four different types of vegetables. So I'll have Brussels sprouts and kale and celery root and carrots. Yeah. Um, when I snack, I make little balls with seeds and nuts and different superfoods in them. Um, and then for dinner, I cook with my kids. We do a lot of like curried lentil, veggie stews and quinoas and fish and um, things that they love and that are easy to cook. Is there such a thing as plastic surgery for diastasis? Because this woman was saying that she was trying to find a surgeon who could do it properly and not just a mommy makeover. And I didn't know if there was a surgery that would help with this. Yeah. So there is a surgery for diastasis recti, but it's it's not if you can heal it on your own, please heal it on your own without the surgery, because the surgery makes it look better, but it does not heal the functionality. So mm. there can be a lot of issues from it. The The connective tissue is not meant to be rigid. It's supposed to be incredibly flexible, and it moves when we rotate our ribs and when we walk and as we bend. And when you stitch it up, it's a little bit like putting staples through something that's supposed to be a rubber band. I think a big takeaway with you today has been in order to be strong, you must be flexible. You must have the yin and the yang. You must have the balance. Yeah. And all, and also, yes, absolutely. And that's true in our bodies. And that's also true in life. And it's true in how we integrate exercise into mommyhood. I know there are a number of cities where you do offer your services, Erica. So tell everybody where they can find an Erica Bloom Pilates studio. Yes. So I have a studio and a certification school for diastasis in New York City. Uh, And I have two in the Hamptons, one in East Hampton, one in Watermill. I have one in Greenwich, Connecticut. I have one in Turks and Caicos, and we have one in Los Angeles in Brentwood. And in all of our locations, we also can come to your home. So if you don't want to leave your baby, we can meet you at home. Oh, that's amazing. amazing. Erica, tell everybody who's listening where they can find you and follow you. Um, I have a website that is ericabloompilates.com, and my Instagram is at ericabloompilates. Eric Bloom, you guys, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. This was amazing. I can't. I need like amazing. a month to just process I everything. I want to go home with her. Can, can you guys? I know. Well, we're, let's go home. do a we're class together. Let's go yeah. work out. Let's go work out. Oh, semi-private. <laughs> I can't wait.